Okay, well, let's uh, turn to 1 Samuel tonight. You know, this one's called the Jonathan Revival, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, we're uh, we're going to be talking about Jonathan tonight and his armor bearer. And, uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, young people, you can go to the back. I'm so sorry. I, uh, Y'all just take them out, okay? Just you don't have to worry about me. I'm like I don't have to dismiss them. You guys just head back there, okay? That way I won't. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so First Samuel, while they're heading back there. Oh, okay. So sometimes the Bible, uh, sometimes the. Uh, the passages throw me off a little bit here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want us to look at uh, chapter 13. We're going to be looking at a, a, a few verses here. But um, I want us to just uh, look at the situation that is going on here and just kind of break it down a little bit and uh, just point some things out to you that I think are pertinent to our situation today. And uh, this, this, uh, this I, I may be able to finish it tonight. If I don't, I'm going to make sure that I get you out in plenty of time and we'll continue uh, uh, next time uh, as we... Uh, as we do this, not next week, but we'll um, we'll we'll pick up after next week. So, uh, but let's look at. I'm hoping to finish it tonight, though. But let's look at verse one, okay? Saul in verse in chapter 13, First Samuel 13. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him three thousand men of Israel, whereof two thousand were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people, he sent every man to his tent. Uh, wasn't a very wise thing for Saul to do. He's not really the greatest general here. And um, he sent about 3,000, or he has 3,000, sent the rest of them away. And um, so the, the situation isn't very good. 3,000 men really isn't a whole lot when it comes to preparing for battle, especially when you have an enemy like the Philistines. And uh, so chapter, uh, verse 3 says, And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibeah, or Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots. Okay, now did you just, did you see what, do you see how many chariots they had? All right, now, how many men does Saul have? He has 3,000, okay? They have, we're talking 3,000 soldiers. Uh, the Philistines have 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. Okay, the Philistines are getting ready to whip up on Israel. It's very, it, it's kind of, it's what you'd say kind of obvious, right? So uh, let's keep going here. Um, uh, and they came up and pitched in Michmash, uh, uh, eastward from beth -Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Okay, so you've got a, you've got a, a, a certain type of people here. And if you're taking notes, you can write down that we have fearful people. All right, today we've got people who are fearful. We have, uh, we, we have people who would rather hide than actually go out and, and, and say anything about Jesus. And I realize that door knocking, it kind of, uh, it, it's a, you know, I, I was just talking with uh, some of my friends overseas and they were talking about how that they're having to re-strategize and rethink the method of, of, of soul winning and telling people about the Lord. Because you can get somebody to say a prayer. That's easy. That's, that's not hard. You can even put somebody underwater. But as far as as far as them actually making a profession of faith today, it's you know there, there's a there is a uh, there there's a block as far as as far as people understanding the gospel. The fallow ground needs to be broken up, and so 
uh, you know, but the thing about it is, is that we need to at least open our mouth about something with the Lord. We need to at least hand out a gospel tract or tell people, have a burden, seek, you know, try, try to, you know, as Jonathan was saying, you know, we need to design something that's going to help uh, 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 get people's attention and, um, you know, and, and, you know, just have people who are actually going to give them out. So, you know, that we've got fearful people today. You know, um, I, I have to admit, I, I, can, I tend to be fearful. Uh, when it comes to door knocking, when it comes to visitation, when it comes to giving out uh, new moving baskets, I'd rather go hide than go and meet strangers. I'm just not a, I am not a, 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 a meet new people kind of a guy. Some of you are, I'm not. Uh, but I, I do it because the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to go out and teach all the world. I'm supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. And so uh, when it says preach, it's proclaimed. It means share the gospel, tell the gospel to people. Uh, you know, uh, one, one method of doing that is saying, hey, I'd love for you to come to my church where you can know for sure that you have eternal life. And it gets people's attention. Do you, do you know that you have eternal life and just, you know, kind of do it in a friendly way? I don't pressure them. I don't push them. But I do try to make, I try to plant the bug in their ear. Hey, do you know Jesus is your Savior? Do you know for sure if you were to die five years from now, five weeks from now, where you would spend eternity? And it's important that they know because the fact is, is they are hell bound sinners. But we have to be careful. We have to recognize that, that, that there are fearful people, all right? So... That's the situation that's at hand. And then it says, I want you to look at uh, what it says in verse 7. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. All right. Uh, as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. Okay. So there's, there's, uh, there, there's some more fearful people. Okay. Um, and then uh, verse 8, and, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that, that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither the burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, uh, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. So we've got a situation now where the king, you know, he's, uh, the, the people are scattered from him. There's, a, there's the, just, a, uh, just the, the whole situation's a mess. You know, sometimes we can tend to make rash and quick decisions, uh, foolish, all right? So we have fearful people, we have foolish people as well. Saul would be a foolish person. Sometimes we make foolish decisions. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've, I've, known, I've known churches who have taken out loans and were unable to pay them because of the situation that was at hand. And uh, I'm not saying there's, not, there's, there's everything wrong with a loan. I don't really agree with loans. I think that we ought to be able to you know, I think we ought to make sure that everything's, uh, you know, that, that our bills are paid, things like that. But uh, I understand the situation that's at hand sometimes when it comes to that. But we have, uh, we have fearful people today. We have foolish people today. And, um, and uh, so he says, therefore, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now, thou, for now, the Lord, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And Samuel arose and gat him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about six hundred men. And Saul and Jonathan his son and the people that were present with him abode in Gibeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped at Michmash. And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned into the way that leadeth to Orpah, unto the land of Shual. And another company turned the way to Beth Horon. And another company turned to the way of the border that looketh to the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. Now, I want you to, now, so, so here's another situation. All right, so I, I, I basically want you to see the whole picture of what's going on. All right, you've got guys who are hiding in caves and rocks. You've got these foolish decisions being made. And then not only that, but you have uh, the Philistines coming and they're, they're splitting up into three different bands and they're spoiling the Israelites. They're coming and they're taking whatever they want to. And then I want you to notice even more. It's, it's, I'm going to be honest with you. This is one of my favorite stories because it's, it's, it's exciting, but it's funny at the same time. 
Uh, look what it says in the very next verse. This is the best part about this story, okay? Verse 19. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Let the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. They had to go to the Philistine camp in order to sharpen their weapons, okay? Now, look, look a little bit further. Yet they had a file for the paddocks and for the cultures and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. All right, so, Wilson, you have a file, right? That's all they had. They had a file. All right, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what I mean by a file. I mean, I don't care how big that file was. They had axes and coulters and spears and swords that they had to sharpen with just a file? <laughs> I mean, the situation is really bad. So uh, what do we have to sharpen? The, you know, I, I, can see, I can see Saul right now. He's just been told he's getting ready to lose the kingdom. We, he just got news that the Philistines have uh, plundered property in three different areas. You know, if it doesn't get any worse than that, he goes around and he sees this guy practicing with his sword and it's not cutting anything. And he goes and he feels the sword and he's like, these weapons are dull. Does anybody have a sharpener around here? Well, we've got to sharpen our swords by the Philistines. The Philistines have sharpers. You mean they actually let you go and do that? Yeah, yeah, they do. You know, it's just, it must be absolutely absurd. Do we have anything to sharpen? Well, we got a file. That's it. Just one, one file. I mean, it's just, a, it's a mess. So verse 22, so it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, was there found. Okay, so they had weapons, all right? And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Big Mash. All right, now, let's look. We're going to keep going here. And um, I, I, I really was hoping that I could find exactly, let's see here. Okay. In this story... And I think it's in chapter, I'm not sure if it's in chapter 12, but I, um, okay, there's, there's four different groups of people, all right? And basically in this passage, we're reading that there's fearful people who go and they, 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 they hide in caves and in rocks. Then you have, uh, then you have uh, the foolish decisions that are being made here. Uh, then you have, um, uh, then you have, the flabby, all right, which are the lazy people, all right? We have, and I'm just kind of speeding things up a little bit. We'll read about, uh, about Saul sitting under a tree, basically sipping tea and eating donuts, waiting for news, you know. Uh, so we have that going on. Let's keep going here. We'll read this story. Uh, now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side, but he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron, and people that were with him were about 600 men. Okay, so the flabby. All right, that's the lazy, the, the people who just really don't feel like doing anything. We have that in our churches too. Uh, we have that as, I mean, and I'm talking about the universal church as a whole. Uh, I see so many missionaries who are giving, they're telling me, I, 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 I've been asking them, and I'm guilty, I'm guilty of, of, of being a part of the flabby as well as the fearful. I, I, I've, I've been out of, I, I just told you I was in touch with John Mark Catalan. I haven't talked with him in probably a year. And when I sent him a message, he said, don't worry about it, Pastor. I know I haven't heard from you a whole lot, but you keep in touch with me more than anybody else. And I hadn't talked to him in a year. And the thing is, is he's setting a goal that says, Pastor Michael, I said, what's your goal? What's the biggest thing that you want to see happen over there in the Philistines? And his goal is this. I want to be able to set up, I want to plant a church within a 10-year time bracket. Do you believe God can plant a church within a 10-year time bracket? I believe he can, absolutely. And you know, the thing about it is, is the reason why he believes that way is because that's about all they're going to see out of the mission field if we, if we continue to be flabby here in the United States you know, it doesn't just take money to support our missionaries. It takes prayer. It takes earnest, fervent prayer to get on our knees and tell God, look, this is what brother so-and-so needs. This is what Travis needs. You know, we're seeing the situation at hand in 
Colchester, and we're seeing the situation that, uh, you know, in the, the Philippines, and we're seeing situations where uh, people are not able to get to the mission field the way that they want to, and it's because we're not getting on our knees and praying and fighting the battle for them. I believe that we would see so much more happen in the mission field if we would get on our knees more and pray for our missionaries. And, uh, you know, we need to pray for one another, pray that God will give us boldness, pray that God will give Pastor Mike boldness. Pray that God will give me boldness to be able to lead when it comes to uh, 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 evangelism, sharing the gospel. Pray that God will give me wisdom so that I can actually do it right, so that I don't make foolish decisions. Uh, it's so important that we do these things. Uh, let's look at uh, verse 3 here. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest, and Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages by, uh, by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side, and the name of the one was Bozes and the other Sina. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. All right, now, um, uh, also, uh, uh, there, was another, there was another group of people that I failed to mention in chapter 13, it said that they were scattered abroad, all right, which means that they had gone and they went to fight with, they went to fight with the Philistines. They said, you know, I don't know if you've ever, uh, have you ever met a diehard Cubs fan? You know, the, you remember back when, you know, the Cubs finally won their World Series, all right, but do you remember for all those years, the Cubs just could not win a World Series, and I remember there was a guy when I was a, when I was a, uh, a German teacher right across the hall. He was, a, he was a science teacher, and he had the biggest Cubs poster hanging up, and he would always wear a Cubs hat coming in, and I, I would always pick on him, and I'd say, look, I don't care how diehard Cubs fan you are. The Cubs are never going to win the World Series. I would pick on him, you know. And he would say, once a Cubs fan, always a Cubs fan. I found him on Facebook the other day, and sure enough, his profile is a Cubs, is a, a Cubs symbol. You know, but, uh, you know, he, he, and, uh, you know, when I finally got in touch with him, he goes, I told you we'd win this World Series. I said, yeah, you were right. But, uh, but you know, the thing is, is no, matter how, no matter how bad the team was, he was a diehard Cubs fan, you know. And that's the thing about some of these, these guys in Israel is they, they decided, you know, whoever team is winning, that's the team I want to be on. Isn't that how people are today? Today we're seeing so much church hopping. Oh, I heard a joke. My wife told me a joke. She said, she said some church, uh, she said uh, some church members or, or, or some church goers, their favorite, um, their, favorite, uh, their favorite place to go and eat is IHOP. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how it, how, how it was worded, but, uh, but I, I just got, I got tickled about it because, you know, church hoppers. And, uh, you know, so the thing is, is they want to go to the place where it's working out the best. And so, uh, let, me, let me turn this down here, okay. So, if, you know, they, they want to, they, they, they want to go to the place that's going to feed them the most. They want to go to the place that's going to entertain them the most. They want to go to the church that's going to give them the most programs, that's going to babysit their kids like you were talking about. They want to go to, I'm not, I'm not harping on large churches here, but I'm saying that we've got so many people who are unwilling to dig in and entrench in the battle and fight the battle. You know, instead of, uh, you know, instead of being dissatisfied with the pastor, get on your knees and pray for him. Pray that God will ignite a fire. I know some of you have done that. Some of you have prayed for me and I've gotten my fire back again and it's wonderful. And you keep on praying. Keep lifting me up in prayer. You know, don't stop praying because things are getting better. Keep on praying. Pray that God will continue to move our church forward. Uh, you know, uh, in the midst of uh, some of the bleak things that I'm seeing ahead of us, I'm still encouraged. I feel like God's given me faith. You know, um, uh, he's given me a, a, a new heart, a new desire. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to get everybody excited. You know, I, you try and stand up here and preach sometimes. Sometimes I get looks that are like, you're going completely over my head, Pastor. I mean, it's like, it's hard sometimes to stand up here and preach. And it's hard when you don't have that many that are here and they look at you like, what in the world are you talking about? All right. The thing is, is, is my faith has been kindled and it's important that we continue to lift one another up and encourage one another and, 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 and go forward rather than bail out when things are bad, you know. But I am, I'm very encouraged even though things are looking strange in the future. You know, we've, we've traveled through some dark waters and it seems like we have yet to go through some more dark waters. 
Some of the stuff that I'm hearing about in the news, it's just absolutely crazy. Uh, you know, where's our country going? The decisions that are being made, I just, you know, I, I just don't know. But, but, uh, but, but, but that's, you know, it, it's important that we, that, you know, so, so that the other group is the fickle. All right. That's, you can write them down as the fickle. All right. The ones who have joined with the other team. All right. We've got fickle people. We've got fearful people. We've got uh, foolish people, flabby people. We've got all of these problems that are going on. And so here they are. Jonathan. So, so here's Jonathan and here's this armor bearer. And I love this story. This is just one of my favorite stories here. Um, uh, I, I want you to look at what it says. Um, Verse 5, the forefront of the one was situate northward, these are the rocks, all right, over against Michmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. I love how commentaries, commentators, they try to discredit God. Have you ever read any of these where the commentaries basically say, now it's important that we focus on the situation of Bozes and the situation of Sina because this is how Joshua had made such an amazing victory and how he was able to discomfit the enemy. No, it wasn't, it was God. That's what it was. And at verse 6 it says, And Jonathan said to the young man, young man that bare his armor, Come on, and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. I love this. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Can I tell you something? That's great faith coming from Jonathan. That's right. You, you've got, you have, uh, you have 30,000 chariots. 6,000 horsemen, an innumerable host of soldiers. You don't have any weapons. All you have is a file to sharpen the weapons that you have. And the Philistines have said, under supervision can you go and sharpen your weapons at our place. It is a mess. Not only that, but you've got, you've, you've got uh, Israeli soldiers who have gone and joined the enemy camp. You've got soldiers who are afraid going and hiding in caves and in rocks. You've got soldiers who are, you've got a king who's making foolish decisions. And then you've got lazy soldiers just sitting under the pomegranate tree and just, you know, just uh, having a good old time while everything is falling apart. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we'll die. That's pretty much the attitude that they have. They're surrounded. It's a situation that cannot be fixed by man alone. And here's Jonathan, and he's got his armor bearer. And here's the thing. It's not just Jonathan. It's his armor bearer. It's his armor bearer. All right, I want you to notice this. All right, look what he says. And Jonathan said, it said, he said come, come and let us go over under the garrison of these, of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Can I tell you, that's all it takes for, to, get, to get God's attention. No matter how bleak, no matter how difficult, no matter how uncertain the situation might be, if we look to God and we say, it may be that God's going to work still. Even though things look dismal, even though it might seem like things are not going well for the church, even though it might seem like, you know, the, uh, we've got troubled waters ahead, even though it might seem like just, just, you know, there's decisions that you're having to make. Some of you have shared with me and have told me to pray about decisions that are being made legally uh, concerning, you know, the, the COVID, and I'm not going to mention anything because we're live. I don't want to get cut off again, get get imprisoned again, <laughs> YouTube. But uh, anyway, um, uh, but but let's look what it says here, okay? Um, verse seven. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee, according to thy heart. I love that. The armor bearer. You know, that's what I've been telling our missionaries, by the way. I said, I know you're not used to me. I know you're not used to pastors in the U.S. sending you messages like this. I've been sending these really big, encouraging messages and just telling them, you know, look, I'm, I'm with you. I'm praying for you. Uh, what, how can I pray for you? What's a bad situation? What's a good situation? I've been telling them, you know, look, I, I want you to tell me. Let me know any movement that you might see. And, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, it's almost kind of like they're... they're well, we got this little problem right here, and uh, well, he seemed to be okay with that one. So let's let's tell him this problem right here, you know. And they're they're treading lightly, and I, I don't know what it is. I, I told him, I said, look, I said I, I don't know if it's because you think that I'm spying on you and trying to decide if I should keep supporting you or not. I said honestly, our church can't support you, but so much, and so it does does it really matter? I said just tell me, you know. And I've had some people. 
just say, you know what, I'm going to tell you. And they told me the situation. And I said, you know what, we're going to pray about this and we're going to see God come through. It may be that God's going to do this. I said, can I tell you something? And I, this is what I told them. I said, I said, I want you to turn and look. I'm with you. I said, I don't care how crazy your idea is, whatever plans you have, whatever mode of attack you have in the, in the field that you're in, I want you to turn and look. Mike Barnett's behind you. I want to be your armor bearer. I'm going to carry your armor for you. I'm going to carry the burden for you. I'm going to lift you up in prayer. And that's what I've been telling them. I've been, cur- I mean, I've been encouraging our missionaries. And I've been saying, turn, behold, I'm with you. No matter what you do, no matter what, how crazy the situation might be, no matter how crazy your dreams might be, no matter how big the plans are that you have for what you want to do. You know, I, I've had some of them... Uh, <laughs> Honestly, I haven't had anybody who's shared anything that, that, that's really all that impressive. You know, um, I, I think probably Cannon Bloom is probably the most uh, impressive guy. He said, uh, he said uh, I'd like to have five, five disciples that are, that, that, are, that, that are able to put their nose to the grindstone by the time I, I leave here at the end of 2022. He wants five, five disciples. And uh, so now we've got Frank, we've got Chin Wei, and we've got... Um, We've got Frank Chinway, and I'm trying to think of who the next guy is. There's a third guy, uh, Paco. Paco. Some of these names are really strange. They're, it's what they call American names, and I'm like, well, I guess he chose to go Latino a little bit, you know. But uh, but but the thing is, is, is he's got three guys that he's working with. Paco is a safe man. The only problem with Paco is that he's not on fire for God. The other two are not saved, but they're asking questions. And so I told him, I said, you know what? I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if these guys would get saved and you had three disciples and then we'd need two more. And the thing about it is, is he's got about 329 days left. I've got it written down on my phone. I can't look at it right now. But there's not a whole lot of days left. 329 sounds like a lot. But when it comes to making disciples, it really isn't a whole lot. You need to pray that God will help those men. That they'll, that, that, they'll, that they'll buckle down and they'll make a decision because the Bible says go. There's no, there's no other point to living than to be discipled and go out and share the gospel after what you've heard. Be able to teach others also. Pray that he'll be able to reach these men. Pray that he'll make disciples. That's what God said. We need to unlock the doors of heaven and turn loose the will of God here on earth. God said preach the gospel to every creature. And I don't think that he meant reach the world by, by the time I get back. I think he meant reach the world in every generation. That's what I think. I think God expects us to reach the world around in our generation and then reach the world again in the next generation and in the next generation. I think that's what God meant. Unfortunately, we haven't really seen that. But God said, preach the gospel to every creature, every creature, every creature. Are we seeing that? I'm not seeing that. And the reason why is we're not seeing disciples being made and we need to pray that God will work. And so we need to encourage our missionaries and say, hey, turn around. Look, I'm with you. Whatever it is that you want to do, whatever decisions you make, I'm with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support you. I'm going to pray for you. And we're going to see it happen because God's able to do this. That's the attitude that we ought to have for them. And so uh, he said, turn, behold, I'm with you. And look, I love this. Jonathan. Jonathan has the craziest uh, plan. Look what he says in verse 8. Then said Jonathan, behold, we will pass over unto these men. And we will discover ourselves unto them. How many of you have ever seen Night at the Museum? Okay, all right. The Battle of the Smithsonian. I'll never forget that, uh, okay, basically in this movie, these, these characters, these, uh, these, these museum figures come to life based on this magic tablet. All right, it's, it's a really funny movie. But, um, but, but General Custer is one of the, one of the guys, uh, that one of the, one of the figures in the Smithsonian. And so when this tablet shows up, he comes to life, all right? And he's, you know, he looks like a human, all right? And, you know, and uh, they're, they're all trapped inside of this, trailer, you know, and he comes up with this idea. He said, he said, now, here's the plan. He said, when I announce attack, we will jump out of this box and attack. (laughs) I love it. All the people inside of the box are looking at him like, are you kidding me? You know, of course, you know, General Custer, Custer's last stand, he's looked at as a failure, all right? I think of General Custer, whenever I read this story, Jonathan says, Jonathan says, we're going to discover ourselves to them. Basically, he's saying, when I yell, attack, we're going to attack, okay? 
That's not much of a plan, but here's Jonathan. Remember, the armor bearer said, I'm with you. Whatever crazy idea you have, I'm with you. If I was the armor bearer, I'd be like, look, I know I told you I was with you, but that is insane. <laughs> We're going to reveal ourselves. Hey! It's just two of us. Well, Jonathan... He, he says, he says, we're going to discover ourselves unto them. I don't know exactly what that meant, but it sure does look funny. And it makes for a funny story. But anyway, <laughs> verse 9. I mean, hey, look, the situation is so bad. I really think he actually meant we're going to expose ourselves. What have we got to lose? I think that's what he meant. All right. So in verse 9, it says, if they say uh, thus unto us, tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. Verse 10, but if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand and this shall be a sign unto us, okay? So notice that he, not only is he going to the Lord, all right, he's basically put his faith in the Lord, but he's also going to put his faith into practice, all right? He's trusting to obey. Personally, I think that they had a little bit of a prayer meeting. Okay, I don't, we don't see it right here in the scriptures, but, but we do know that Jonathan was a man of prayer. He does reach out and he prays with David. He has a prayer meeting with David. And I think that Jonathan was in touch with God. Uh, my son asked me questions. He said, uh, you know, why, why, why did God allow to happen what happened to Jonathan? And, and uh, you know, that's a very difficult question to answer as far as the, the situation that went on. However, because of... David's relationship with Jonathan, many of Jonathan's family members were spared, especially Mephibosheth. What a wonderful story. Because of that relationship with Jonathan, David saw to it that Jonathan was remembered. They were very close. But Jonathan here had faith, and, and, he, and I think the reason why they were so knit together was because of the great boldness and the faith. He was like, I'm not the only crazy guy that exposes himself in front of all these Philistines. This guy's going to go fight a giant. I like him. I think they were a little bit crazy. I think that's why they were such good friends. But, uh, but anyway, so, uh, so, he, so, so here they are. They, you know, he, he, he tells them, verse 11, and both of them discovered themselves. Okay, so they did it. Hey, you! Imagine all these. We're talking an innumerable host of soldiers 30,000 chariots, 6,000 uh, horsemen, and here's two guys going, hey, you down there. <laughs> That's basically what happened. All right, so uh, it says, and both of them discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they have hid themselves. Oh, these scary cats, they're, now they've gone crazy. All right, so verse 12, it says, and the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us. Ah, oh, there's the key word, okay? And we will show you a thing. All right, so that's what he says. Uh, uh, he says, and Jonathan said unto the armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. <laughs> if I was the armor bearer, I'd be like, Whatever you say, boss. All right. But they go down. All right, look at verse 13. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, an half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. All right, now, 20 men with two guys, that's pretty good. But there's still a problem. <laughs> there's still an innumerable host of Philistines. There's still 30,000 chariots. There's still... 6,000 horsemen, they've still got a major problem, all right? But, do you, but I want you to notice how God responds. The Bible says it's a principle, a revival principle, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That's what they did. It may be that the Lord will fight for us. And I want you to notice, all right, look at verse 15. And there was trembling in the hosts in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled and the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked and behold, the multitude melted away. And they went on beating down one another. It's really a funny picture. I mean, Saul's like, what's going on over there? <laughs> you know, there's like 3,000 guys, that's it. This innumerable host across the way. And all of a sudden they're like, it's like they're melting away. You know, they're just kind of dwindling away. Hey, what's going on over there? 
And Abner kind of gets his, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know how he's able to know, but he said, looks like they're beating each other down. I mean, they're killing each other, you know. <laughs> what in the world's going on? You know, the thing about it is, is God was at work, all right? Now, uh, uh, look, verse 17, then said Saul unto the people that were with him, number now and see who is gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said unto Ahiah, bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at, what was at that time with the children of Israel. Um, and, and, it, and it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priests that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, withdraw thine hand. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves and they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow and there was a very great discomfiture. Sure enough, they're beating each other down is basically what Saul's saying. Okay, now, first of all, I want you to notice two men, all right, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst, all right? And sure enough, these two men, they say it may be that the Lord will fight for us. And so they go and they put their faith in the Lord. They put their feet to practice. They slay 20 guys, not too bad, but the Lord's like, oh, look at that. Those guys believe me. <laughs> he just shook that whole battlefield to where those guys just started beating each other down. And look what it says in verse 21. I love this. This is revival, folks. And it can happen with just two people. Verse 21. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, all right, there they are, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to me with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan, all right? They're like, hey, Israel's winning. Let's go back to their team. Okay, so they got right. Verse 22, likewise, all the men of Israel which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard from the Philistines, uh, heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over unto Beth Avon. Um, I love that. I love that. That's just such a wonderful ending. So the fearful no longer became, they were no longer fearful. All right. The flabby, they got up and they assembled themselves and got ready to fight the battle. The fickle, they decided they were going to, they were going to be Israelites. They were going to be men and they were going to fight against this enemy. That's revival folks. And the thing about it is, is the reason why we don't see the revivals that we, that we need, that we saw in the past is because we're not seeing God at work the way that we saw him in the past. We really need to see God move. We need to see God shake. Uh, we need to see God shake this place. And it only takes two. It only takes two people. It may be that the Lord will work for us. I know that, I, I, I know that this was a little bit of a jumbled, kind of disorganized message here. But my, my plea to you is it just takes two people. The revival of Jonathan. That's one of my favorite revivals. I love how that, how, I love how God works in that revival. You know, it's hopeless. That's why I love it. It reminds me several, uh, of several occasions here at New Grace Baptist Church when we just knew there was $5 in the bank. Uh, there were, uh, our lights were getting ready to be turned off. Things were looking really bad. And God came through because we went to him. It may be that the Lord will work for us. That's why I love that. I mean, they didn't have any weapons. They were being pillaged. They were being spoiled. They were completely outnumbered. And God still came through because God was glorified. That's the revival principle. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time we can be together. And Lord, I thank you so much that